edition of the Ulysses S. and Marguerite S. Schwartz Lecture. Uh, we're very honored, particularly honored today, to have Judge John Schwartz and his wife Betsy Schwartz, who have been stewards of this uh, program since it was established in 1974. The lecture is designed to bring to the law school distinguished lawyers with experience in the academy, practice, or public service to share their experiences and ideas with students, faculty, staff, and alumni of the law school. And uh, I can't think of anyone better to reflect these values or reflect the goals of the lecture than our alumnus uh, from the class of 1991, Gary Haugen, who's going to be our speaker today. Gary is the president and CEO of the International Justice Mission, an organization he founded in 1997. It's a human rights agency that works all over the world to secure justice for victims of slavery, sexual exploitation, and other forms of violent oppression. Some of you in the audience had the pleasure of uh, hearing him last year as our distinguished alumnus and distinguished graduation speaker, and I know you're in for a, a real treat today. Uh, the organization is really designed to help promote or help deliver on the promise of the law. In too many countries, the law is not a device for protection for people, but an instrument of oppression. And Gary and his team have um, played people all over the world who are helping to work with individual victims to secure redress and to provide a model for human rights protection. For those of you who are students, if you're interested uh, in his work after his lecture, I encourage you to take his seminar. He's going to be teaching this spring at the college, uh, a course entitled Human Rights and the Rule of Law in the Developing World. And you might also consider interning for uh, the International Justice Mission, which is part of our human rights program, our new human rights program at the school. After the lecture, we'll have a reception outside. I invite you all uh, to join that. But without further ado, I give you Gary Haugen. Well, thank you, Professor, for the kind introduction. I want to thank the Schwartz for providing the opportunity for me to be part of this uh, lecture series. I'd like to thank Dean Levmore for extending the invitation, and I'd like to thank uh, Dean Schill for not uh, rescinding the invitation. So thanks all around, and thank you all for uh, bothering to, to come this evening. Um, it's a pleasure to get to be here with you. I think that one has to actually see it to believe it which is actually one of the biggest parts of the problem. Indeed, vast numbers of intellectuals, policymakers, and thought leaders in the West would say that it is fundamental, but few have actually seen it. I think one has to actually see, for example, what is happening to David. And to do that, one must actually go sit in a Kenyan courtroom, in the, the Kenyan courtroom into which he's about to enter, before one can begin to understand what the public justice system looks like in the developing world. It is safe to say that what is about to transpire would leave any Westerner confused and disbelieving, and it would leave any Western legal professional speechless in the face of the impending absurdity. It is equally safe to say that what is about to transpire would seem utterly routine and unexceptional to a poor person in the developing world. David is, a, David is a slight boy of 16 from the Kibera slum in Nairobi, Kenya. And he looks exhausted and sick when he finally slumps down in the prisoner's box for his day in court. He looks lost and slightly confused, but only slightly, because true confusion would seem to require more mental energy than he can presently muster. You might even think that he's not all that interested in what is going on before him there in the court. Of course, he should be very interested because the court is deciding if he should be executed or not. David has been languishing in a fetid, violent, disease-ridden Kenyan prison for the past eight months. David's nightmare began when he and two other boys were given the task of guarding the water, hole, well, the water hose that provides scarce fresh water for his slum community. When an older man from outside the community tried to siphon off some of the water, an altercation ensued. Infuriated, the older man fetched a police officer friend and had the boys arrested for robbery with violence. Robbery because the older man said he had lost his hat in the melee. Three things are important to know about the crime of robbery with violence in Kenya. First, robbery with violence is a non-bailable offense. 
which simply means that no matter how absurd the charge, once you've been arrested, you will sit in a Kenyan prison for months or years until the indescribably slow court system has reached a full disposition on the merits of the case. Second, robbery with violence is a capital crime with a mandatory death sentence, a sentence of death by hanging. Thirdly, these two facts combine to make this offense one of the most powerful tools by which police extract bribes from the poor. If they can afford it, families will pay almost any price to keep their loved ones from being tossed into this nightmare by the mere naked accusation of the police. Police who are consistently rated in public surveys as the most corrupt segment of all Kenyan society. So David has had a rough eight months awaiting his first opportunity to respond to the charges against him, and now here he is on trial for his life. David's too poor to pay for legal representation, so he gets what most of the poor in the developing world get when they come to trial, and that is no legal representation. David doesn't get incompetent or sleepy or second-rate legal counsel. David, like the vast majority of the poor in the developing world, enters the public justice system with no legal representation at all. Of course, the vast majority of the people in such developing countries are poor. So, when one pictures the public justice system in the developing world, one must picture a system in which the hundreds of millions of people who actually live in those countries have no access to the professional services that are presumed to be necessary to make the system actually work. Indeed, David and any other poor person will just have to do the best he can in defending himself. But this will be hard because the entire proceeding in the courtroom is conducted in English. David does not speak or understand English. So David faces being hung by the neck until dead at the end of a legal proceeding in which he has no legal uh, representation and cannot even understand what the prosecutor and the judge are saying. But again, David's circumstance is not an exotic anomaly or a quirky story from the Nairobi newspapers. The fact is, David's story will never make the newspapers because there's nothing interesting about it. David's experience is the routine. It is the system. Now, the system works a little differently for Lily in Peru. Lily's 14 years old and has been raped three times in the last month by the same taxi driver in her Andean town of Huanuco. To understand how the system works for her, you might have to sit with Lily at the police station when she finally musters enough courage to report the assaults. If you were not there to see it, you might not imagine all the ways the police find to humiliate her, asking, why did you entice him? Why are you bothering this man? Why do you bring shame to your family? In the end, they simply refuse to investigate the complaint or to arrest the rapist. The truth is, none of the police in Lily's town have ever actually been trained on how to conduct a rape investigation or how to interview a child victim of a sex crime. When I first visited Lily's town of about 70,000 people and talked to lawyers, police, and community leaders, virtually no one could remember the last time someone had successfully been convicted of rape. And that might explain the headline that appeared in the local newspaper during my visit, namely that 50 victims of rape had sought treatment at the local medical clinic in the preceding five days. Most of those victims were Lily's age of 14 or younger. Likewise, one would probably have to go to India and actually sit outside the office of a senior regional magistrate to see how the system fights crimes against poor people, particularly the non-trivial crime of slavery. My colleagues in India and I have done this hundreds of times. Here's what we do. We bring affidavits from poor people held in slavery in local brick kilns, rice mills, rock quarries, and other facilities. These documents vividly describe the brutalities of their slavery, the exact location of their captivity, the precise identity of the slave owners who are holding them, and the precise Indian laws that are being broken, all packaged together. And many times we bring video evidence of the slave owners openly boasting of their crimes. Were we to simply leave such evidence with the magistrate, 
the precise official charged under Indian law for the enforcement of laws against bonded slavery, we know exactly what would happen next. Nothing. Likewise, we know what would eventually happen. Nothing. And over the years, we've seen a host of reasons why. The magistrate has never heard of the Bonded Labor Abolition Act of 1976, let alone read it. Or he's too busy. Or he'll respond if we come back next week. Or he thinks the slaves are probably lying. Or he needs more evidence. Or it's a government holiday. Or he doesn't have the funds for the required restitution payments. Or he thinks the slave owners are too powerful. Or again, probably next week would probably be better. At the end of the day, perhaps one has to stand in the stifling heat of the magistrate's anteroom to begin to appreciate the mind-numbing ineffectiveness of a justice system that manages to tolerate 10 to 15 million children, to say nothing of the adults, who experts tell us are currently held illegally in bonded slavery in India alone. One also might go with me to the Special Victims Unit office in the headquarters of the National Police in Lusaka, Zambia. This is the unit specially charged by law to defend the rights of women and children, especially widows who find themselves being thrown off their land by more powerful families when their husband dies. Zambian law grants the widow and her children full rights to the land and the family property, the mud brick house, the bed, the bicycle, the tin pans. But when the man dies, it's open season for more powerful families and relatives to simply steal it all away. Such dispossessions are taking place at an epidemic rate in sub-Saharan Africa as husbands and fathers are swept away by the AIDS epidemic. The widows and orphans have the law on their side and the special victims unit on their side, but there are some practical problems. First, if you have the law on your side but no lawyer, you lose. In Zambia, a country of about 11 million people, there are only about 250 practicing lawyers. I frequently enter buildings of law firms where there are more lawyers in the building in the United States than there are in the entire country of Zambia. Needless to say, the lawyers in Zambia, like lawyers anywhere, are trying to make a living and do not build their business model around service to impoverished widows. In fact, our office in Zambia estimates that there are perhaps 10 lawyers in Zambia who provide legal service to the, services to the poor on a full-time basis. So outside the offices of these 10 lawyers, one might picture a very long line of 8 million Zambians who live off less than $2 a day. But perhaps the police officers at the, victims, the special victims unit, they can help. And when my colleagues and I bring a report to their office of several widows in the village who are being dispossessed, the officer seems, seems eager to help. That is, if we can give him a ride to the village in our vehicle, because he and his colleagues have no vehicle, and if we are willing to pay for his lunch. And while we might on this occasion be able to do both for the officer, it doesn't take much imagination to picture how such a system usually works for vulnerable widows and orphans. Indeed, for the great mass of poor people in the developing world, if asked about the public justice system, they could probably point to things in their country called police, or courts, or laws, or lawyers, but these things are generally of zero practical use to them in their lives. These ineffective public justice systems have become, for the poor in the developing world, the tragic broken link in the chain of human rights protection mechanisms put in place over the last 60 years. Without effective public justice systems to deliver the protections of the law to the poor, the great legal reforms of the modern human rights movement rarely have any impact in the lives of those who need these systems the most. Moreover, this state of functional lawlessness means that much of the poverty alleviation efforts of international development assistance is blocked, stolen, or rendered useless for the poor. Therefore, my contention is this, that helping build effective public justice systems in the developing world should become the new mandate of the human rights movement in the 21st century. To begin with, it's difficult to overstate the degree to which public justice systems in the developing world are broken, irrelevant, and dangerous to the poor. In June 2008, a careful UN report estimated that a staggering 4 billion people live outside the protections of the rule of law. 
The stunning conclusion of the UN study was simply this, quote, most poor people do not live under the shelter of law, unquote. In the developing world, virtually every component of the public justice system, that is the police, the lawyers, the prosecutors, and courts, generally diminishes the ability of the poor to enjoy the protections of the law. First, consider the police, who generally serve as the poor person's first point of contact with their public justice system. The average poor person in the developing world has probably never met a police officer who is not corrupt at best or gratuitously brutal at worst. Indeed, the most pervasive criminal presence in the lives of the global poor is frequently their own police force. A large study conducted by the World Bank revealed that in the developing world, the poor experience the police as a source of danger rather than protection. According to the study, the poor view the police force as a group of vigilantes and criminals who actively harass, oppress, and brutalize them. As a result, in a moment of danger, the poor in the developing world do not run to the police, they run from the police. Even when police are inclined to protect the poor, they frequently lack the training, resources, and mandate to be of effective practical assistance in defending the poor against violence. If a poor person's contact with their public justice system extends beyond the police, it's frequently because he has been charged with a crime. As we saw in David's case, the poor person charged with a crime in the developing world often will not have the benefit of a lawyer. Compounding the problem is the general scarcity of lawyers in many developing world countries, where a naked accusation by a police officer against a poor person frequently puts her liberty or life at risk without legal representation. And with an income of one or two dollars a day, if a lawyer were available, the average poor person could not afford to pay any legal fees. In the U.S., there is approximately one lawyer for every 768 members of the population. In Cambodia, there is one lawyer for every 22,000 members of the population. In Malawi, a country of 11 million people, there's one lawyer for every 40,000 people. With typical ratios like these, the average poor person in the developing world has probably never personally met a lawyer in their life. Moreover, within the tiny number of lawyers in the developing country, public prosecutors are an even smaller subset and far too small to handle the volume of cases. Many prosecutors are not even trained lawyers. Indeed, many judges in the developing world are not trained lawyers. And like the police, many extract bribes to drop cases. For a variety of reasons, courts in the developing world rarely resolve cases on the basis of the law and the facts. The enormous backlog of cases in the developing world often results in cases languishing indefinitely in overloaded dockets. For instance, experts estimate that at the current rate, it would take 350 years for the courts in Mumbai, India to clear their docket. In Delhi, it would take 466 years. According to the United Nations Development Program, India has 11 judges for every 1 million people. There are currently more than 30 million cases pending in Indian courts, and cases remain unresolved for an average of 15 years. As a result, those detained pending trial sometimes serve more than the maximum length of their sentence before a trial date is set. The International Center for Prison Studies, for example, found that nearly 70% of the detainees in Indian prisons have never been convicted of any crime. Some courts are so far away that the poor cannot physically get to them, and their cases are decided in their absence. Judges and magistrates sometimes solicit bribes in exchange for favorable verdicts or to continue the case indefinitely. Some courts do not even have access to the applicable law, and consequently rendered decisions without the benefit of the controlling legal text. Finally, the average poor person frequently does not know that the abuse she suffers is even against the law. If she is aware of the law, she's unlikely to have ever seen such a law enforced on behalf of someone of her social status. On the contrary, she's far more likely to know someone who's been a victim of the public justice system than a beneficiary of it. As a result, law enforcement is not one of the social mechanisms that she considers useful for navigating the threats against her daily life. 
We might ask why then? Why do these public justice systems so massively fail the poor? The first explanation may come from the fact that many of these justice systems were never intended to serve the poor in the first place. Many public justice systems in the developing world were designed for colonial administration and have never been fundamentally redesigned. Their core systems of policing and judicial process were established during the colonial era and were never set up to serve an indigenous, overwhelmingly poor customer public, but to serve the colonial administration and its narrower interests and beneficiaries. And for the most part, these systems have never been overhauled and retooled to serve a post-colonial objective of broad public service. As the colonial powers departed, authoritarian governments frequently inherited and used these same justice systems in much the same way as their colonial predecessors. That is, for controlling the public rather than serving them. And while many governments were forced over time to make liberal adjustments to their laws, often under pressure from the international human rights community, the enforcement of these laws was left to the public justice systems that were never intended to serve a customer public of overwhelmingly poor people. Not surprisingly, another reason that public justice systems fail the poor is that the people in power have little incentive to transform such systems. The transition from this colonial model to a public justice system has a f that effectively serves the poor requires sustained commitment by power actors who currently have little or no incentive to seek change. Now, in the absence of functioning public justice systems, business, commerce, and economic elites in the developing world have developed substitutes or workarounds that supply the services that a functioning public justice system would otherwise provide. So instead of relying on police for security, they hire private security forces. Instead of submitting their disputes to clogged and corrupt courts, they establish alternative dispute resolution systems to take their place. And those with financial means use social relationships, political relationships, and bribes to resolve disputes involving their interests. The poor, however, cannot afford to opt out of the public justice system by private means, and so they must depend on a decrepit, abandoned, and disintegrating public system. A well-functioning public justice system would tend to limit the power of elites and require a substantial commitment of financial and human resources. At the moment, they see no serious upside to justify that investment. For ruling elites in the developing world, broken public justice systems are not a problem, but functioning public justice systems might be. Under such circumstances, in theory, the traditional human rights movement exists in part to intervene on behalf of those who are marginalized in these societies. But unfortunately, this movement has largely neglected the task of helping build public justice systems in the developing world that work for the poor. The story behind this is perhaps worth examining. The first stage of the modern human rights movement began at the close of World War II with the goal of articulating and establishing international human rights standards. This effort was a remarkable success. Scholars, jurists, diplomats, and statesmen produced the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, as well as international conventions addressing discrimination, torture, children's rights, women's rights, and other issues relating to marginalized groups. The effort to define international standards continues today in the drafting, promulgation, and amendment of international treaties, conventions, and protocols. And what has emerged is a body of rights and norms to which all people of the world can now lay claim. If this first stage of the modern human rights movement was largely intellectual, the second stage was marked by a political movement to embed these international human rights standards into national law. Legal reforms that would replace traditional or colonial standards with codifications of new international standards for basic human rights embedded into local national law. For instance, in conformity with international norms, South Asian countries passed laws outlawing bonded slavery. African countries threw off centuries of traditional cultural practice and gave women the right to own and inherit land. 
Southeast Asian countries elevated the status of women and girls, creating new laws to protect them from sexual exploitation and trafficking. Latin American countries replaced authoritarian regimes and adopted international standards for arrest and detention procedures and codified land reform rights. As a result of this global political movement, country by country, hundreds of millions of the most vulnerable and abused became entitled to global standards of justice and equity under local law. The tragic problem, however, is that the enforcement of these rights under national law was handed over to utterly dysfunctional institutions of national law enforcement that do not enforce the law for poor people. For the modern human rights movement, and for all those who pursue international aid and development among the global poor, the implications are catastrophic. Without a credible public justice deterrent, poor people by the hundreds of millions are relentlessly subjected to assault, rape, imprisonment, extortion, enslavement, theft, dispossession, and removal. Looking back on the story, one, might, one can see that two generations of global human rights work have been predicated, consciously or unconsciously, upon assumptions about a functioning public justice system in the developing world which, if incorrect, effectively undercut the usefulness of those efforts for their intended beneficiaries. Now, absent an effective enforcement mechanism, the great work of the first two generations of the modern human rights movement can deliver to the poor only empty parchment promises. This reality should, I think, radically impact the way we prioritize the investments of the human rights movement in the 21st century. Suppose, for example, that scientists worked feverishly for two generations to develop and fill warehouses with miracle vaccines that hundreds of millions of sick people in the developing world desperately needed but could not access. The absence of a delivery system that would effectively carry those vaccines to those who needed them most would take nothing away from the medical advances the scientists had achieved, but it would suggest an urgent new priority for the international public health community. Likewise, it takes nothing away from the historic significance of the modern human rights movement to say that the brokenness of the public justice systems in the developing world render the promise of that movement largely undelivered to those who need it the most. But it does suggest that the urgent, and it suggests the urgent need for a fundamental shift in the agenda for human rights in the 21st century. After 60 years developing and refining vaccines that rarely reach the bloodstream of actual sick people, we must now shift our focus and resources toward delivering those vaccines to those who are dying without them. Moreover, the absence of functioning public justice systems for the poor also tragically undermines the usefulness of $2.5 trillion worth of foreign aid sent to the developing world over the last half century, because there's no effective mechanism to prevent those with power from stealing it away, blocking access to it, or rendering it useless for its intended beneficiaries. First of all, without rule of law and effective enforcement mechanisms, resources earmarked for aid efforts often never reach their intended beneficiaries. A World Bank study found that as much as 85% of aid flows are diverted to purposes other than that for which they were initially intended. Indeed, unchecked human rights abuses undermine the effectiveness of even those goods and services that do manage to reach the poor in those communities. Farming tools, for instance, are of no use for widows whose land is stolen away. Vocational training is no use for men and women who are rotting in jail for refusing to pay a bribe. Medical clinics in the community are of no use for slaves who cannot leave the brick factory even when they are sick. Microloans are of no use if the proceeds from the new sewing machine are stolen by the local police. Similarly, the inability to restrain human rights abuses has seriously undermined attempts to improve the health of the poor in the developing world. For instance, a World Bank report found that gender violence was the cause of more ill health among women and girls than malaria and traffic accidents combined. Another WHO report showed that in some countries, up to nearly 70% of women report having been physically assaulted, and up to 47% report that their first sexual intercourse was forced. Surveys of villages in India show that 70% of women 
had suffered at least two forms of physical violence in domestic abuse in that year. And 16% of all deaths during pregnancy are from domestic abuse. Studies from Peru report that about 40% of girls will be victims of rape or attempted rape by the age of 14. 70% of HIV-infected women and girls in South Africa report having been forced to have sex. AIDS education does little to help women and children who are contracting the virus from forced sexual encounters. Now given all this, one might expect that remedying the failure to provide rule of law to the poor would become the central focus of international efforts. Yet few, if any, international human rights or development agencies focus specifically on building public justice systems that work for the poor. These agencies do other very, very important work, but none measures organizational success by its ability to help police and courts in the developing world bring effective law enforcement to the poor. None. The problem is not that these agencies fail to see the dysfunction of public justice systems in the developing world. Indeed, some of their researchers have been meticulously documenting the problem for decades. Why then have none of these great international agencies made it a fundamental operational priority? First, international human rights and development agencies manifest doubts that building functioning public justice systems in the developing world is even possible. However, as a historical matter, the fact that almost all functioning public justice systems in the developed world were once malfunctioning suggests otherwise. For example, 125 years ago, police and courts in the United States were nothing like the professional, albeit very imperfect, law enforcement system that we now take generally for granted. In fact, they, were, they very much resembled the public justice systems that we see in the developing world today. For example, in 1895, the New York State Senate's Lexow Committee collected testimony from hundreds of witnesses regarding pervasive police practices of extortion, bribery, counterfeiting, voter intimidation, election fraud, torture, and thuggery. Police brutality was found to be an established and recognized practice. Police spoke openly of bribing their way to a particular rank or duty assignment, the most lucrative assignments being in the red light districts where police extracted hefty bribes. In his seminal study of American policing in the latter half of the 19th century, Samuel Walker writes this, from the moment of their creation, the police were creatures of partisan politics. The officer on the beat was less a public servant than an agent for a given political faction. To gain even a nominal amount of respect for their authority, policemen frequently resorted to violence in order to gain, by means of the nightstick, the respect that the public would not freely grant. Thus began a cycle of disrespect and brutality. Finally, the police had only a minimal commitment to the enforcement of laws. As political operatives, as political operatives, they were more interested in furthering the interests of their sponsors. From the beginning, the police became the central figures in an intricate system of racketeering and corruption. Now, to those who follow policing in the developing world, Walker's description sounds very, very familiar. More importantly, it suggests that many of the challenges facing public justice systems in the developing world in the 21st century are like those largely overcome by the urban centers of the industrializing West over the last 100 years, albeit imperfectly. Of course, justice systems ruled by corruption, cronyism, and theft do not change by themselves. Such change must be fought for, but change is possible. The idea that dysfunctional public justice systems can never provide reasonable protections for the poor ignores the history of that transformation in many parts of the world. On the other hand, given the amount of discussion in certain circles about governance, good governance, and rule of law, one might imagine that massive efforts are already underway to address these needs. As a factual matter, however, it must be conceded that practical, sustained efforts to develop functioning public justice systems in poor countries has rarely been attempted. Recently, there have been some attempts to build functioning public justice systems as part of larger nation-building strategy in post-conflict situations, like Iraq and Afghanistan. These efforts do manifest a growing, even desperate appreciation that public justice systems are utterly fundamental to any basic socioeconomic progress. But these efforts are very new, and they've not been seen 
and, and, and similar investments have not been seen in public justice systems of more stable developing countries where the other bottom billions live. Outside these few post-conflict settings, the amount of money, intellectual effort, professional investment, political and diplomatic capital that's been poured into addressing public justice systems in the developing world is a tiny fraction of the amount poured into fixing health systems, food systems, water systems, financial systems, transportation systems, and so on. For instance, the US Agency for International Development, for instance, spends less than 1% of its budget on rule of law programs, and only a tiny fraction of that is spent on programs that might be described as helping public justice systems work for the poor. When donor countries have invested in law enforcement training in the developing world, it has been largely focused on protecting the donor country from the spillover effects of international crimes involving narcotics, arms trafficking, counterterrorism, and the like, rather than seeking rule of law for the poor who live in the developing country. Rule of law, anti-corruption, and good governance funding generally has not focused on helping public justice systems deliver effective law enforcement to the poor. Rather, such funding has overwhelmingly focused on two things. One, reducing theft or misappropriation of donor aid. And secondly, building those components of the public justice system that provide law enforcement protections for business and commerce. Now, these are both good, important, very important good things. But they do not, in and of themselves, make public justice systems work for the poor. This is not their outcome goal. On those rare occasions when donors have invested in public justice, the investments have been too small and isolated to make a sustainable difference. Examples of these weak efforts might be the court reporter machines in Zambia that broke and were, never, uh, and were left unrepaired, or the one-man UN monitor of the courts in Cambodia who faithfully reports how bad the courts are or police or prosecutor training from Western counterparts that involve a few nice days at the Sheraton, but no measurable change in performance. In short, outside the post-conflict setting, effective reform of broken police and courts in the developing world has not been tested and found impossible. It's been found difficult and left untried. Accordingly, some of us are now calling for a fundamental transition in the modern human rights movement in which the dominant focus must shift from legal reforms to practical legal enforcement. The most significant work we can undertake to serve the poor in the developing world is to help develop public justice systems that regularly enforce the laws that were painstakingly developed over the first two stages of the modern human rights movement. The time has come to move human rights from wholesale to retail, to take the wholesale human rights promises stored in the warehouses of national law and deliver them to the poor who still stand in line for justice at the retail level. And what might be the conceptual framework for doing so? Creating public justice systems in the developing world will require two things, political will and capacity building. To achieve large scale, sustainable impact, approaches to developing political will and increasing capacity must work at the micro and macro levels. Macro level approaches have the potential for broad impact by targeting leaders in diplomatic, political policy, or high level management roles who do set the agenda for the larger core of enforcement personnel under their authority. But developing political will and capacity at the macro level will not benefit the poor unless the priorities and capacities flow down to those who enforce the law in the streets. Capacity building investments might include, for example, one, financial assistance to build vetted police and judicial units with salaries above the petty corruption line, two, material resources that give police, prosecutors, social workers, and judges the basic tools of their trade, three, practical and sustained on-the-ground casework training, four, legal aid and supportive social services for the poor. These kinds of investments are expensive, but they represent a fraction of the trillions of dollars in, the de in development assistance that's been of questionable long-term value in the absence of effective public justice systems for the poor. In the coming era, development assistance should be linked to the willingness of authorities in the developing world to commit to the kind of transformational process that is possible with serious investments in building the capacity of public justice systems. International incentives can also support and encourage the nascent movement of local social demand 
for functioning public justice systems that are already emerging in the developing world. Movements of social demand from cadres of enlightened national leaders, from a middle class that's growing impatient with endemic corruption, and from the investment community's appreciation of the competitive advantages that await developing economies with functioning public justice systems. The challenges presented in this law enforcement era call for new approaches and skills tailored to the unique nature of the task. Because law enforcement occurs at the ground level, micro-level strategies that develop the capacities of street-level law enforcement must be a significant part of the process. One promising model of international assistance that has emerged over the last 10 years is a methodology of collaborative casework. Under this model, human rights lawyers and law enforcement professionals collaborate with local law enforcement to identify individual victims, extricate them from oppressive violence, and support the prosecution of the perpetrators through the local public justice system. This model then uses data from a large volume of individual cases to gather concrete information for assessing what structural changes in the public justice system would be most effective. In this sense, the case-driven model works for solutions from the bottom up. Of course, broken public justice systems cannot be fixed everywhere at all at once in regard to every failing. Therefore, collaborative casework must be uh, applied in a targeted manner. A case-driven agency might select a precisely defined geographic area and focus on a single category of abuse that's relatively uncontroversial and non-threatening to the political establishment. For instance, helping authorities in a particular city in the developing world to fight sexual violence against children. Starting with this small step of political will, a, a case-driven agency can begin capacity building. Working case after case of child rape with the authorities, they work together to solve any problems along the way to secure justice for the victim. In the process, a case-driven agency builds a relationship of trust with local constables, prosecutors, judges, and social welfare authorities. It does not publicly embarrass them if they lack competence or integrity, except perhaps as a very last resort. Rather, it helps train them in professional methods and creates opportunities for them to receive credit for good work. Eventually, a few leaders and achievers begin to catch the professional joy of using their skills to hold perpetrators accountable for child rape in their community. And after observing widespread abuse by local law enforcement in the developing world, there may be doubts that any local law enforcement in the developing world would ever work to help the poor. But such radical skepticism is just too strong. The notion that all public authorities in the developing world are hopelessly corrupt, apathetic, and brutish is simply not supported by the facts. Wherever the case-driven model has succeeded, it's been because of local authorities who acted with courage and competence. They are there. What they need is political support, training, and resources. And once they are empowered, crimes like child rape are no longer treated as peripheral offenses. Instead, child rape becomes a crime that receives attention, special training, international resources, and professional regard. Over time, officers, prosecutors, and judges experience success. And poor mothers in the community start to believe that cooperating with the police might bring justice. Everybody along the public justice pipeline starts to see for the first time what their job was supposed to look like. And many begin to take initiative to learn to do their job well. Eventually, in one place in the developing world, in regard to one category of abuse, the public justice system begins working for the poor. This collaborative casework approach requires a sustained commitment on the ground over a long period of time. But there is evidence that it has worked on a small scale. For instance, in one Southeast Asian city, the agency that I work for was able to witness a 70% reduction in the victimization of children in the commercial sex trade as measured by outside auditors after just two years of collaborative casework targeting that form of abuse. For citizens and public justice professionals who've never seen laws enforced on behalf of the poor, the impact is transformative. Success generates a demand from constituencies who've never dared to hope. Dormant and defeated middle-class demand for rule of law is rekindled. Leaders emerge who are encouraged by the social demand, and obstructionists begin to be marginalized. I don't believe there's really anything about the essential dynamics of this approach that cannot work on a larger scale with greater resources and investment. Anyone who believes that the poor do not care about public justice has not seen how far the widows will walk for it, how doggedly the mothers will demand it, or how courageously the slave will risk his life for it. 
The process of helping the public justice system work for one category of abuse provides then experience, allies, assets, and self-confidence for making the system work for the next category of abuse, to widow land seizures, to forced labor, to domestic violence, to illegal detention, to police abuse. In time, there is one place in the developing world that has a vastly improved public justice system that protects the poor from the brutalities of oppression. And to move toward this model, the international human rights agencies must develop practical knowledge and expertise in the technical administration of justice. The international human rights community is now dominated by researchers, scholars, legal theorists, media advocates, diplomats, and policy experts who are experts at developing standards and assessing compliance with those standards. But the movement has not developed extensive expertise and experience in delivering justice through police and court systems on behalf of individual victims. Accordingly, the human rights community will need to recruit practitioners to the task and shift its strategic focus to the problem. Aid agencies face a similar set of challenges because they've become experts in devising in ingenious workarounds and coping mechanisms to deal with failed public justice systems in the developing world. They've spent decades innovating ways to help poor people survive in the absence of a working pipeline of justice, and it may be a disorienting shift to move towards actually fixing the pipeline. But investments to improve the administration of justice are critical to the long-term success of efforts to provide the poor with functioning schools, clean water, microloans, food production, and the other life-saving programs of international development. To meet the challenges of the current era, I believe, both the human rights and development communities will have to restructure and retool their movements to include those whose background and expertise allow them to diagnose and to repair the pipes and plumbing of broken public justice systems. In support of these practical applications in the field, I believe there's also opening up in this generation a vast and indispensable field of intellectual inquiry that has barely begun to be excavated. For instance, what is the lost historical account of how functioning public justice systems have, be, have been bravely fought for and tediously built out of chaos and corruption? What is the precise legacy of colonial public justice administration in the developing world as it manifests itself in contemporary legal codes criminal procedure, rules of evidence, and police practice. Given a country's economic development, what is an appropriate level of investment of resources in the infrastructures of public justice? How is social demand generated in different cultural and country contexts for the enforcement of laws, as opposed to the social demand necessary for the mere enactment of laws? How does one meaningfully measure whether a justice system is working for the poorest? There are, I think, at least a dozen groundbreaking PhD dissertations embedded in these questions that might provide answers that could make a significant impact in serving alongside the world's most vulnerable poor. Indeed, what would it look like for law schools to inspire and prepare practitioners with the intellectual depth necessary to build rule of law in extreme cross-cultural contexts of poverty and grievous dysfunction? On behalf of hundreds of millions of poor people in our world who suffer, endure, and otherwise make themselves small under the vast shadow of lawlessness, the time has finally come to hammer together a shelter of justice that makes human rights meaningful and international development sustainable. Such, I believe, is the opportunity for service for this generation of scholars and practitioners in the law. Thank you very, very much. So we have time for a few questions, at least. And uh, Gary, why don't you take them yourself? Great. Uh, we'll start with the easy question first, please. Yes, sir. Um, what can a law student actually do at the moment right now? Because it seems like there's a lot of training on events or problems that you have listed, but what 
what would you suggest how one could get involved? I think it's important to take great advantage of your legal education to actually understand deeply these institutions which um, we've had the benefit of thinking deeply and rigorously about for hundreds and hundreds of years and there are really powerful things to be learned. So um, work hard in the classes that you, that you have. Um, and, and I do think though a particular focus in the areas of uh, criminal law, of, of government, of um, but even, it's fascinating, uh, I, I tremble in the presence of uh, Professor, he Professor Hemmeltz, who's here, my, my property uh, uh, professor. I can't even speak right in his presence. And, uh, <laughs> but to, to, uh, to appreciate the beauty of a functioning property rights system. And that is understood, I think, most powerfully in the absence of it. So first of all, uh, if you're able to go to the developing world and number one, just be amongst poor people just try to actually solve some, some issue or problem and try to understand what it's like to do that in the developing world. Because even though we may learn these brilliant things about how to make functioning public justice systems work, the even harder thing will be to figure out how to translate that helpfully and humbly alongside people of very, very, very <coughs> modest means. So there are issues of technique and there's questions of character that also need to be developed in order for this to actually work. Uh, I would also invite you to visit uh, the International Justice Mission website. There's a little article I've written there about how to prepare for careers in this area and to come be an intern with International Justice Mission or to otherwise serve with other agencies uh, who are increasingly offering some opportunities for students to learn what it means to uh, do the, the tactical work of fixing broken public justice systems. Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I absolutely love your thesis about um, the issue being the application of the laws in on the ground level. And I think some of the issues with that is that a lot of times it takes knowing the culture, the customs, or the language in some cases. And so how do you, re do you are you suggesting that organizations actually send people who are willing to live among the people for many years at a time just to learn in the systems? Or um, I guess how do you make that function? I think it's a lot easier from the outside looking in to just donate it and set standards because you're not among, you know, living there. Right. So how do you, how do you solve that? that issue, I guess. My overall thesis has to do with empowering local champions of this change. Um, and so the, the way to do that, I think tremendously, is, an, is incarnational. It's actually going and being uh, among them, to learn from them, and to figure out how to make this difficult translation of what skills and resources one may have in support of their own aspirations for what it is that they are, they are seeking to do. Um, so none of this will come from the genius and power of outsiders without the ownership and application of indigenous uh, champions. But, uh, but they can use support and companions in the process, especially because they are up against enormous forces of power within the community who do not want change. Uh, so they will take different forms of service. Some will have the opportunity to and will need to actually go and spend a lifetime there. The way people who wanted to who want to help in these other spheres of helping a health system, uh, well, you there's a whole lot culturally. You just need to understand in order to actually make that more more good than harm. Uh, and so many have given their lives to being able to go and acquire that kind of understanding. Others, though, make sure that the the the, the policy coming out of uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, government uh, actually provides funding for those kinds of efforts. So it can be something that is very remote in the way that sort of AIDS funding in Africa has had a tremendous capacity to um, uh, bring uh, transformation. Uh, but it, has, it will only be applied helpfully tactically on the ground to those who made a deep investment in understanding the culture and the people. Yes, ma'am. Um, you talked about uh, colonial, leftover colonial legal systems right. in the developing world. And there's right. also Which ones, the colonial ones or the, no, the more traditional, traditional ones? Legal 
I haven't seen yet a ton of good execution upon the traditional systems. Um, many of the traditional systems, I would say, though, uh, are not great for poor people and those with less power. They're, they come from many, many circumstances, a traditional hierarchy of power that didn't work out well for the, for the vulnerable. And what you had in the, in the, the sort of interesting story, in a way, is that colonial powers, while they were ruling and administrating these countries, themselves went through a tremendous transformation in their own societies of increasing the franchise, being, becoming more democratic in a way that allowed the public to make sure that their public justice system was more responsive. So they went through this tremendous evolution over about 150 years, but none of that evolution took place within those countries that were being ruled as colonies. But they got these institutions called police and called courts and so forth, which no one in the developed world would now be satisfied with. No one wants to live in, the, in uh, Great Britain or France or uh, the United States of the 1820s. Uh, we don't want to accept the equity of the public justice system from that era. Uh, and, but that is significantly, in terms of process, uh, what much of the developing world is, is saddled with. And uh, so I do think there can be appropriate um, uh, good look at what might be customary practices that would actually be perfectly useful and genius for providing uh, rule of law, equity, uh, protection of people's rights. Um, uh, but what, we ha what I've seen is that the, the traditional or Western forms have been so discredited because of their corruption and brutality that people want to get rid of those and then reach for traditional or communal solutions for public justice, which are not always so great. So there's, there's some dangers there for poor and vulnerable people as well. If we have time for one more question. Great. Yes, ma'am. Did you raise your hand? Yeah. Um, so if your thesis is about um, empowering Right. that would be sort of um, removing power from the oppressors, right? So is there, is there anything within your, within your model that accounts for sort of, um, wealth is a big part of power. Is there anything that's in your model that accounts for going after the sort of financiers, the wealth of these, like, for example, transnational um, trafficking networks and, and that sort of thing? Because um, it seems to me that that would be um, an interesting avenue to think about. It is in a certain way, except that what one we have found amongst the, the, the poor is that most oppressors of the poor are not massive power actors. Because it doesn't take much to oppress the poor. And that significantly, uh, uh, this, most of the massive victimization of the poor is, is crime of opportunity is driven not so, so much by the overwhelming power of the perpetrators, but by the utter vulnerability of the victims. So where one is able to identify sort of these very large, well-financed, organized crime networks or syndicates that are responsible for some horrific abuse against a massive number of poor people, then true, you're going to have to address that center of power. But most poor people, uh, in the developing world, their daily experience of violence and oppression in their person is coming from a very localized center of power, which nevertheless needs to be addressed because if it, likewise in our community, if there was no local law enforcement just simply protecting us from someone else taking advantage of us, we would be taken advantage of on a regular basis. And that is what's absent um, uh, in the daily life of the poor. So where are we going to find those sort of need to address the, the sort of larger economic uh, entities that uh, abuse their power? Very important, and to bring a proportionate power to bear to be able to defend those who are weaker. But uh, my thesis generally addresses uh, what is the daily reality of the poor, which comes from the oppression that comes from them in their own community. Thank you for your patience. Are there more questions? Uh, but we'll have another opportunity outside of the reception here over here for a bit of time. So please join me in thanking you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.